The Blue Nile is the river of religion. It represents life to the farming and fishing families along its banks, and it gave life to the Aulia, the holy men and women who believe deeply in God and spread that belief up and down Sudan's Nile from the 15th century. The good Jazeera cracking clay soil that could hold any seeds and then nurture them quickly sustained a culture of faith that was pledged to monotheism. The one God, Allah, was the complete inspiration for a culture that was built on devotion and community and trust that God's prophet, Muhammad, provided the model for a perfect human life on earth. Many of the holy men and women are known to us today. Their resting places are marked by tombs, kubab, that are visited by the faithful to remember those whose paths followed perhaps more in step with the prophets than our own weak ones. There are many, many of these saints buried in the Blue Nile village of Abu Haraz, just a few kilometers upstream from the birthplace of Mahmoud Muhammad Taha. Ustaz Mahmoud, Ustaz an honorific in the Sudanese Arabic pronunciation of the word for teacher, often visited Abu Haraz and knew the contribution that these holy men had made to the spiritual development of his country and her people. He wrote, The Sufi leaders of the past made contributions to Islamic culture that are equaled by none in depth of thought and richness of quality. The Sufis tried in their writings to convey to us experiences that belong to the greatest heights and depths that the spirit of man has yet reached for all I know. But Mahmoud Muhammad Taha and his followers, men and women known collectively as the Republican Brotherhood, wanted to take their respect for Sufism, often thought of as Islam's mystical aspect, and updated to guide modern life and address its modern challenges. As the American scholar Cornell West wrote about Taha in his 2004 book, Democracy Matters, Taha conceives of Islam as a holistic way of life that promotes freedom, the overcoming of fear, in order to pursue a loving and wise life. We reconsider the life, words, and actions of Mahmoud Muhammad Taha today to remember someone who understood deeply the Islamic faith's capacity to bring peace to the individual and to the world. That a message of peace and human freedom could develop out of Sudan, a country little known today except for intolerance and decades of war, has perhaps been the major reason that Taha's work has been overlooked. Taha and his followers tried to communicate this work from far outside circles of wealth and power, and forces have been at work in Sudan as well, bearing Ustaz Mahmoud's teachings, harassing his followers, and leaving little room for open dialogue on questions of Islam's role in the modern world. But the intense exposure to all things Islamic in the last few years has also opened the door to differentiate that faith's many possibilities and offers us a chance to, re to consider an Islamic scholar with a universal message. Mahmoud Muhammad Taha began his life dedicated to freedom as a colonial subject of the Anglo-Egyptian condominium of Sudan. He was born 100 years ago in the town of Rufa a community completely steeped in Islam as was typical for the region. Sudan had been a British colony since the Battle of Omdurman in 1898. While Taha did not have the traditional religious education associated with many Islamic leaders of the time, his upbringing was intensely spiritual in the Sufi manner, combining work with religion. He went on to formal schooling and attained the highest level of education available to Sudan's colonial subjects at the time, graduating as an engineer from Gordon Memorial College in Khartoum. Ustaz Mahmoud began his professional life in the 1930s, and from there joined with other college graduates and intellectuals in Sudan's quickly developing independence movement from the latter part of that decade. It was clear from the start of his involvement that decolonization or political independence for Taha were only first steps towards true human freedom. Colonialism was the denial of people's freedom, and his political party, the Republican Party, tried to lead the way toward establishing an independent Republic of Sudan. 
but its manifesto was Islam. As he said about his party in a later interview, the party's ideology was built on Islam. We opposed the tendencies of some of the other political parties towards an Islamic state because we were sure that they did not know what they were talking about. An Islamic state built on ignorance of the pure facts of Islam can be more detrimental to progress than a secular state of average ability. Religious fanaticism is inalienable from religious ignorance. The Republican Party was the most explicit party in outlining a program for the formation of an Islamic state, only we did not call it Islamic. We were aiming at universality, because universality is the order of the day. Only the universal contents of Islam were tapped. In 1946, in the midst of the independence movement, Ustaz Mahmoud and some of his fellow party members moved from theory to practice by demonstrating against the colonial government with handbills and booklets. He was arrested, spent two months in jail as Sudan's first political prisoner, and then was quickly back at these provocations with an incident that came to define the contours of Ustaz Mahmoud's complex philosophy of human spiritual development. His actions spoke to both gender issues in Islam and African social development in a manner not heard before in Sudan's march to independence, applying his original thinking in Sudan's streets. The British colonial authorities had outlawed the ancient and pre-Islamic practice in Sudan of female circumcision. A woman had been arrested by the authorities for circumcising a young girl. Taha led a demonstration at the jail where she was held, demanding her release, not because he supported the harmful practice, but because he felt strongly that the British could not legislate Sudanese cultural values. The only way to eliminate the practice of female circumcision, Taha felt, was to raise the social and educational status of Sudan's women, who could then speak up for themselves on such difficult issues. For these anti-government activities, Taha was sentenced to two years in a colonial jail. When he left prison, rather than return to the pre-independence political campaign, he retreated to his hometown of Rufa, where he immersed himself in the deep spiritual quest which was common to Sufi practice. He ate sparely, spoke with few, and grew his beard and hair long. Mahmoud Muhammad Taha emerged after two years of this khalwa, or retreat, with a new understanding or interpretation of God's words, which would bring humankind to the modern standard that was Islam's potential. He later said about the experience, My concept was so new, I became a stranger among my own people. Taha's convictions rested on the well-known history of the Qur'an's revelation, that the Prophet Muhammad had received some of the verses of the Qur'an while starting his community of Muslims in early Mecca, and some when he journeyed with them to Medina. The latter verses generally spoke to a community in turmoil, searching for direction as the Islamic community came under attack. The former verses, those revealed in Mecca, generally had a tone of peace and intended to guide the Prophet's personal practice and that of all of mankind into the future. Taha began to work on a book which he called The Second Message of Islam, which explained how Muslims could base lives of peace, of gender and social equality, and enlightened progress by following the prescriptions of Qur'an's texts revealed to the Prophet in Mecca. This focus on the Meccan texts of the Qur'an was viewed by some conservative Muslims as heretical in that while it was understood that the Medinan texts were directing life in 7th century Arabia, to leave out part of the Qur'an, complained the conservatives, was completely unacceptable. But Ustaz Mahmud was adamant in his declaration that focusing on the Meccan texts of the Qur'an was the only way to maintain a modern Muslim world in the image of the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad and he began to lecture on this topic, write about it, and slowly gather a strong group of followers who chose to accept his principles of Muslim life, which were particularly welcoming to women. It was perhaps the emphasis on a strong role for modern women in the Muslim community and in providing them with education, which brought Taha and his organization, now known as the Republican Brotherhood, after his political party, the most controversy. Through the 1960s and 70s, they were physically and politically harassed in the streets as they attempted to sell books about Ustaz Mahmoud's thinking, 
or denounced from the nation's mosques. In the 1980s, the regime of then-Sudan President Jafar Nameri imposed the harsh so-called Sharia laws throughout Sudan, which were ostensibly based on parts of Quranic teachings. Ustaz Mahmoud and his followers began to write and speak out in public against the imposition of these laws in the country, which was not but 60 to 70 percent Muslim. Seventy of the brothers and sisters, including Ustaz Mahmoud himself, were arrested for these acts against the government, and after a brief trial in early 1985, Mahmoud Mahmata was declared an apostate, in Islam one who has abandoned his religion, and executed for this capital offense on 18th of January 1985 at the age of 76, an act in itself against the principles of Islamic law. The 17-year regime of Jafar Nameri was overthrown quickly by popular revolt shortly after the execution, and Ustaz Mahmoud's daughter, Asma, took the case of her father's declaration of apostasy to the Sudan Supreme Court. The verdict was overturned posthumously, and his property and good name were, were returned to the family. The Republican brothers and sisters continued to spread Ustaz Mahmoud's message of peace, tolerance, and spiritual development around the world, and try to keep his inspiring words alive in their hearts. He is remembered today as an important early nationalist leader in Sudan who brought Africa's spirituality into the discourse on human freedom. We conclude this brief introduction to the life of Mahmoud Muhammad Taha with his final words spoken in public at his 1985 apostasy trial in Omdurman. <laughs> September <laughs> وللإسلام وللإسلام أكثر من ذلك فإنها شوهت الشريعة وشوهت الإسلام ونفرت عنه يضاف إلى ذلك أنها وضعت واستغلت لإرهاب الشعب وسوقه إلى الاستكانة الاستكانة عن طريق إذلاله ثم إنها هددت وحدة البلاد هذا من حيث التنظير وأما من حيث التطبيق فإن القضاة الذين يتولون المحاكمة تحتها تحتها نعم غير مؤهلين فنيا وضعفوا أخلاقيا أخلاقيا أن يمتنعوا عن أن يضعوا أنفسهم تحت سيطرة السلطة التنفيذية تستعملهم 
لإضاعة الحقوق لإضاعة الحقوق وإذلال الشعب وتشويه الإسلام وإهانة الفكر والمفكرين وإذلال المعارضين السياسيين ومن أجل ذلك فإني غير مستعد فإني غير مستعد للتعاون مع أي محكمة لحرمة القضاء المستقل ورضية تكون أداة من أدوات التعذيب للشعب أداة من أداة من أدوات إذلال الشعب وإهانة الفكر الفكر الحر والتنكيل بالمعارضين السياسيين والتنكيل بالمعارضين السياسيين 